encouraging you in these things is scripture. It's always scripture. I always take us back to scripture. And that is Matthew 28, when Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, we do it for his glory and his name. But at the end of the day, it really comes back down to his authority because he has commanded us as the people of God to do these things. Now, as I said, I realize that going somewhere long term is not for everybody. I realize that. But going short term is for everybody. And I told Sarah, we've talked at length about the guy that I met at the, the convention or the guy I met at the conference. He's willing to walk alongside of us to help me give you opportunities to do the short term thing. And I know Sarah's still a part of the NMI teams and they will give us opportunities but these are the, some of the things that you need to train your kids in and put them in a position for these sort of things. So I pray that you'll do these things, that you'll train your kids in righteousness. But as I said, it all started with giving. And so that's where I want to take you to by giving this morning and begin to look at some passages in regard to giving. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Titus chapter two. Let me read a few passages, a few verses together, and then we'll pray and begin to walk through some scripture. I'm not actually looking at my phone. I did set a timer so because, you know, I can get way carried away with this. Start talking about mission. So I'll be sensitive to your time. Titus chapter two. Let me begin in verse 11. Walk us down through verse 14. get to the word of God. Titus chapter two, verse 11. Let me remind you that this is the word of our Lord. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, Godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. Now here's the gospel. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possessions who are, notice the last four words, zealous for good deeds. Let's pray. Father, again, I just praise you for our time. And as we turn our hearts to your words that instruct us and tell us how the people of God, how, how, we, should, how we should live, I pray that your spirit would help us to understand these things, help us to treasure these things and help us to obey these things. All this I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, I started here with the gospel because with the gospel is where it all starts. It was Christ who redeemed us. And if you'll notice in verse 14, he lays everything out for us. He redeemed us by dying for us. He atoned for our lawless deeds. He paid the price for our sins. But he did more than that on Calvary. If you'll notice again in, in verse 14, he also did this to purify for himself a people for his own possession. So not only did he pay for our sins, but he gave us his righteousness. Now we belong to him. Now we've been made like him. And there are both things that you have to communicate when you communicate the gospel. Your rebellion was paid for. The righteous requirements that you must have to appear before God was given to you. But there's more purpose to your salvation in this passage. Notice what he says next. He gave himself to redeem us from every lawless deed, to purify him for himself, a people for his own possessions, who are, what are the last four words? Zealous for good deeds. It's very strong language. Zealous for good deeds. In other words, you need to get over the idea that God saved you so you could go to heaven. Because for most people, that's where their gospel starts and stops. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to hell. That's my gospel. But you got to understand, there's 
so much more purpose behind what God did than that. And in the book of Titus, Tim, uh, Paul is trying to communicate to Titus that you've got to teach the church that God saved you. That God filled you with his righteousness in order that you might go about this life accomplishing great deeds and you're zealous and hungry to do so. Now, he has a context because if you just talk about good deeds, right, anything and many things come to mind and rightly so. But in this particular letter, he has something specific in mind. Look in chapter three down in verse 14. Titus chapter three, look at verse 14. Our people, Paul says to Titus, must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. Now, if I called time out, went around the room and, and asked you about fruitfulness, I think most of you could communicate it's a spiritual thing. In fact, you might run to Galatians and talk about the fruits of the spirit. But you also need to understand that there's more to it than being fruitful in that respect. In fact, if I asked you specifically from verse 14, how can we as a church be fruitful? The only conclusion, if you handle that verse correctly, would be we've got to meet pressing needs. And if you said that, you'd be exactly right. The way we do as a church in order to be fruitful for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God is by meeting pressing needs around us. Now, that narrows the scope a little bit if we're just going to talk to good deeds, because you could say, oh, good dudes is just encouraging. I'm just going to encourage Nathan because he's in a home for church and I'm just going to love him. And that would be a good thing for you to do. But if you're going to work from the context of Titus 314, you'd go, what do you need, brother? And then you would begin to meet the pressing needs that he has in his life. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. You need to tell the church, we must be sure that our people are engaged in the practice of meeting pressing needs. Now, if you look in verse 13, just one verse up, uh, one verse up from that, you'll get it a little even more narrow scope. Paul says this to Titus, diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. In other words, these two men were about to set out on some sort of mission trip, probably carrying one of the Apostle Paul's letters. And so Paul tells the elder of the church of Titus, or tells Titus, the elder of the church, you make sure the church takes care of every single solitary thing that they need. And he leaves the door open. It doesn't matter what it is. You tell the church to make sure that they don't like one thing as they set off on this journey. Meet their needs. And so we can begin to understand from that passage, oh my goodness, this opens up so many opportunities for us as we get involved in using what God has blessed us with now to meet pressing needs. But scripture specific in helping us understand what those needs are. Here, if I was just going to talk about this passage, I'd talk about ministry. And as we get more into giving, I'll talk a lot about this, but you know whose responsibility it is for those people that we just saw on the screen? You know whose responsibility it is that they're taking care of? Us. It's not the IMB. And as much as Cody wants to be the one to work and work and work, it may get to the point where Cody can't teach school because God has called Cody to pastor the church like he's doing now. And we have to make up the difference. The guy that I sat down with and talked, he was blown away when I began to describe for him because it's very difficult for some reason to get pastors involved in missions. And I don't know why that is. I, I know I talk about them like there. I know we're busy, but there's nothing more important than the kingdom of God. And the most significant way to impact the kingdom of God is through missions. So I don't understand the confusion there. But I told him if we send them, we pay for them. And I'm really committed to that. If I've called you to go long term, short term, I'm committed, committed as a body to pay for it. I'm not I'm not going to ask you to go around talking and trying to raise money. And I'm not going to ask you to do those sort of things. I'm telling you, if we send you, we pay for you. Because it's our responsibility to meet the pressing needs of the ministries that God has called us into. Now, it's not just ministries. I want to show you something else. 
But I want to talk to you about the opportunity. So back up for just a few pages to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I want to tell you something about us. And then I'll try to figure out how to land this thing for this morning. Because I know we're starting to get into some time here. First Timothy chapter six. So Paul's telling Timothy here in regard to his church that you must instruct them in regard to one very specific thing. First Timothy chapter six. I want you to look at verse 17. Paul says there instruct those notice instruct those who are rich in this present world, not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is indeed life. Now here's the picture and here's the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Because Paul says to instruct those who are rich, you better get busy in regard to this matter. Now, one of the reasons that you better get busy in regard to this matter, because there's a warning that comes along with possessing many things. If you look back up into verse 10, you'll recall the warning. First Timothy chapter six, verse 10 says, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. And so that's the danger that's inherent with money. You can run yourself in with the sword because you have pursued growing more and more and more. And so there's nothing wrong in and of itself to possessing it. But the danger comes with what you do with it. And so Paul says, or the Lord told the Apostle Paul to protect them from killing themselves by pursuing money, you teach them to be generous in everything. To give and to give and to give so they won't kill themselves. And so that's what we're called to do. And I, by the way, we are rich. You have to consider your context. I ran into Audrey's pastor uh, when she lived in Huntsville that pastored the church there in Huntsville and had a chance to talk with him. And they're in a different context. He's in Huntsville. He's got about 75 or 100 Sunday, uh, 75 or 100 on Sunday morning, just like we do. But they're substantially financially very well off. They're in Huntsville. But we're not in Huntsville. We're in Macedonia. And in our context, we're very, very well off when you consider the whole context of the body. And so that's the context that we find ourselves in to meet pressing needs. And so you need to understand that we're extremely wealthy. And God has put us in a position to be wealthier because we're absolutely out of debt. And now we can begin to shift that and see the kingdom of God. We can begin to meet pressing needs within the kingdom of God just by the blessing that we've received of having more. So this verse 18 comes to us saying, instruct them to do good and to be rich, to be generous, to be ready to share. And notice the spiritual truth that is involved, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life or life indeed. And here's the deal. And this is one of the things that I'm going to teach you over the next few sermons. I'm amazed at what God has done with the physical because he transfers that into the spiritual in the most simplest of ways. People can't understand this, but just simply through giving, opening your billfold and giving money, God says that you're storing up for yourselves an inheritance in glory. That's mind boggling. And there's so many people that are going to be so disappointed with their eternal retirement plan because when they get to heaven, there's not going to be anything in the plan because they've been absolutely stingy and selfish in here and it's going to translate there spiritually. But we've been given the opportunity as a church to begin storing up for ourselves 
heavenly things now by being fruitful and being generous and by meeting pressing needs in the context of the body. Y'all, we're about to start laying aside for our retirement. And I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about there. And so I want us to be diligent to do those things and be found faithful in the kingdom of God by meeting needs and by funding ministries and those sort of things. One plan, and I just want to introduce this and I'll tell you what we're doing. But go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 because this is where we'll be tonight. I'll introduce it. I'll tell you the basis for it. And then I'll talk about how I've been praying about making sure that we're effective in this. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're not actually going to read it. I'm going to tell you what took place. But the Apostle Paul was moving about the churches, taking up money from the Gentiles in order that he might give that money to the Jews in Jerusalem. And here's what's special about that, a number of things. Number one, the Jews in Jerusalem were suffering greatly because they had professed faith in Christ. And because they had professed faith in Christ, they were losing everything. They were losing their jobs. They were losing their homes. They were losing their land. The Jewish people said, if you're going to profess faith in Christ, we're moving you out of the community. You're no longer a part of us. You're on your own. And so they were shunned in so many ways. You can imagine being a business owner that made your profession of faith in Christ, yet the rest of the community hated Christ. How many people do you think is going to come by your shop? And so as they began to fall deeper and deeper and deeper into poverty, the churches had the heart to start taking up an offering from among the Gentiles to send to the Jews, which if you understand anything about culture, that's kind of weird because Jews and Gentiles don't like each other. And so now the Gentiles are beginning to raise money to hand over to the Jews so that they could have food, clothes, and a place to live. And that was going to begin to shape their relationship. But I find it fascinating that once we get into this passage tonight, there was one church, no, there were a few churches in Macedonia who took it upon themselves to give an extraordinary amount. But here's what's unique about that. They didn't have it. They were suffering because of the gospel themselves. They were already in abject poverty and that they gave in such a way as to challenge all the other churches to give as well. Just a handful of churches said, we're going to do this ourselves. And of their own accord, they gave in such extraordinary ways. It challenged all the other churches who were not suffering to give as well. And those were some of the churches within the context of Macedonia. Now, let me show you why they did that. So look down with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. And you'll see the basis for everything that I'm going to say over the next few weeks. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 8 and 9. Paul says, I'm not speaking this, giving, if you will. I'm not speaking this as a command. But as proving through the earnestness of others, the Macedonians, the sincerity of your love, Corinthians, also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You know what the basis for giving is? It's the gospel. The reason you give is to paint a picture of the gospel. This is what happened in the gospel. Christ was rich. Remember Philippians chapter 2? Although he was equal with God, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped for his own purpose, but he poured himself out, he emptied himself and made himself nothing and became a slave. So in other words, through his poverty, you and I become rich through the gospel, right? Every time that you have an opportunity to do those sort of things, you're painting a picture of the gospel. Now, one, one of the reasons I said that I don't share this with other people is because you tell them that and they don't appreciate that and that offends me. Once time, one, several years ago, uh, there was a particular time that a, a, a man came to me and he was really struggling because something had happened within the community that he was accused of that he never did and it was ruining his name publicly. This is a bad deal. And he asked me, well, what should I do? And I took him to Peter. 
And I began to say, man, you got a, such a great opportunity to paint a picture of the gospel. Don't worry about your name. Let your name be blind because your friends and your family know the truth. So don't worry about that because it's exactly what they did to our Savior. Do nothing. Let them ruin your name and you continue to walk faithfully with the Lord. He rejected that counsel. He hired a lawyer. He won and he cleared his name. So you miss the opportunity to paint the picture of the gospel. That's what I said. So I don't like to talk about giving and telling you you're painting a picture of the gospel and you go, so I'm not going to do it anyway. That really rubs me raw. You need to understand that the basis for our giving is the preaching of the gospel. We paint a picture that through our wealth, we might become poorer so that others can become wealthier. Because that's exactly what happened when Jesus died on the cross for us. Now, the last thing is to be certain, and this is the part that I do want to get to, and I know I'm already running out of time. I want to tell you what I've done and what some of us have been praying about and talking about that I want you to give, I guess it's a month away before we actually um, have a business meeting and, and consider these things. So I'm giving you a month to pray and consider over these things. But really it, it hinges around Titus 3.14 where Paul says our people must learn to engage in good deeds and to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. So I, in effect I've entitled this the, the Titus 3.14 something. I haven't got my third word yet. But really, I've developed three levels in my mind to make sure that we're going to be effective in ministering to the kingdom of God in this way. And the first level is the church. And so I've asked, I think it was about eight people to be a part of a committee that their sole responsibility is to give our money away. Now I'm entrusting these eight and I entrust all of you. So if you ever want to be a part of this particular group of people, We'll put it on a rotating basis so that you can be a part of this group. I really want everybody to eventually be a part of this group. But level one is the church. In, in Macedonia, I have Miss C and, and Brittany Williams and Rob and Caleb to give our money away to the, the pressing needs that we find in our community. On the other side of the mountain, I've got Hannah Schultz as a representative in Fort Payne. I've asked Miss Melinda to help us in Fort Payne and Rainsville. I've, helped, I've asked Matthew McKelvey in Scottsboro. I asked Brad to be a part of this. So there's about eight there covering every area that I know of that our people are in so that we can figure out what is needed within our community and we can meet pressing needs. In other words, how it works, if any of us hear about anything, you tell someone on that committee and they can meet via text. And if I will come up with a number, there's eight. So if Five or six of the eight are say, yeah, totally good, 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 good. They just write the check and they do it. See, I trust people. We're not going to meet back in here and say, well, you know, we need to pay. I'll just borrow Rob. We need to pay Rob's power bill and we've got to vote on that. No, no. I've got eight people here I trust to do those sort of things. So I hope that you will consider these people for that particular I don't know why in the world it wouldn't be okay, but I pray that you'll consider these eight people and I pray that when we rotate that you'll be a part of this first level. But there's three levels of this thing. The second level is the deacons. As we were beginning talking about this, some of them said, hey, isn't that the responsibility of the deacons? Well, yes, it is. But in a different sort of way. The deacons is level two, and here's where the deacons play the role. When I have to pay Rob's power bill twice, now I have a question. Why is it twice and is there going to be three times? Because now all of a sudden we've moved out of pressing needs and now we've moved into a more permanent need. And if it's a permanent need, I need our deacons to walk alongside these people to say, hey, you might need help in a different area. Because if I'm having to pay your power bill every month, we need to train you in some other things like living in a cheaper place. OK, so deacons is level two. But then there's a level three when we decide as a church and we've got so many opportunities and Cody and Laura and Tyler and Wallace are not, not what I'm talking about. They're among us. But if we decide to walk along someone else, another ministry or another church, that's when our elders move into this situation. And that's when it's their responsibility to actually go and meet people and see what's actually going on. It's happened to our church and our association. Some guy showed up. He preached a powerful message. 
And he took up their money because he was opening a, what was it, an orphanage in Guatemala or somewhere. And they gave him 20 something, 20 something thousand dollars and there was no orphanage and there was no ministry and he went happily along his way. See, that's on the elders. That's their fault. And so when he reaches level three and we're talking about ministry or missions or we're talking about monthly support and we've talked about Alaska, some of our elders are going to have to go to Alaska and meet some people and figure out what's going on before we send them money. We want to support them, but we got to know you. I'll show you that in the text tonight as well. The reason I'm doing all these things is to make sure we're faithful. I realize, even though I do fly by the seat of my pants so often, sometimes you got to have a plan. Because I'll show you in the text tonight, it's not a good idea for me to preach a message and take up money. In fact, I kind of think that's against the text. Because we're not supposed to give like that. You're not supposed to be stirred in your emotions and pass the plate. That offends the text to me. So I want to be very purposeful and very intentional that we find ourselves faithful and not just come in here week to week and strike up an emotional chord and walk around and pass the plate. I don't want to do that. I want us to move as a body as we accomplish kingdom work, whether it's meeting pressing needs or funding missionaries wherever we may find them. Okay? Odd way to close this, but I've got to stop somewhere. So let's go to the Lord in prayer.